the nonprofit National Popular Vote is very excited to be hosting today's conversation with Professor George Edwards. National Popular Vote was founded in 2005 and advocates for the National Popular Vote Bill, which is a state-based plan that works to reform the Electoral College. When in effect, this bill would guarantee the presidency to the winner of the most popular votes in all 50 states in DC. Our guest, George Edwards III, is a university distinguished professor of political science and the Jordan Chair in Presidential Studies at Texas A&M University. He is the founder of, and from 1991 to 2001, was the director of the Center for Presidential Studies. A leading scholar of the presidency, he has authored or edited 25 books on American politics and public policy, making scores of articles and book chapters. He is also editor of Presidential Studies Quarterly and of course has authored the book that we're gonna talk about today, Why the Electoral College is Bad for America. So I'll be moderating the conversation today. I'm Eileen Reavy and I serve as the National Grassroots Director for National Popular Vote. For those of you tuning in via Zoom, you are able to submit questions for Professor Edwards through the Q&A feature. Please take care to submit them using the Q&A function and not the chat box. We've reserved the last portion of this webinar for questions from the audience, although you can submit them at any time throughout the discussion. This is being shared live on Facebook and will be available afterwards on Facebook and on National Popular Vote's YouTube channel. Professor Edwards, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk with our supporters. I'm delighted to be here. So I wanna start off by making sure that everyone tuning in has a foundational understanding of our current system. So I'd like to start exactly where your book does. Can you please take a few moments to explain the big picture of how the Electoral College works and the winner take all laws that 48 of our states use? Sure, happy to. Well, each state has allocated a number of electoral votes and as a number equal to the number of senators, which is two every state, plus the number of representatives that they have. Uh, Washington, D.C. gets three, three electoral votes, but all the other states have representatives and senators. So they have a certain number. <laughs> then each state, 48 of the 50 states, have decided by their own law that whoever wins the state, whoever comes in first in the state, will receive all of the electoral votes of that state. So <clears throat> there are important consequences to this, but the most important one is a candidate can win some states by very narrow margins, lose other states by large margins, and win the electoral vote while losing the popular vote. So what this does is effectively disenfranchise voters to support the losing candidates because if you even if there are six million votes in your state or your candidate and you come in second those votes it's just as if they never they never occurred they don't count they play no role in the national total so it effectively awards the votes of the people who voted against the winner to the winner because the winner gets credit in effect for all the votes in the state and it does an odd thing it's a perverse thing but it doesn't really matter if one person shows up or a million people show up, as long as you get one more vote than the other other candidate, you would affect get credit for all the votes in the state. So, and it's sometimes it's the case that it's not just the minority whose votes are suppressed, but it's, some, it's often the case that it's a majority that are suppressed. For example, in 2016, 14 states were won on a plurality vote, meaning no candidate receives a majority. So, in other words, in those states, and let's just say it's a state that Donald Trump won, just by way of example, most of the people didn't vote for Donald Trump. Most of the people did not vote for Donald Trump, I repeat, but nevertheless, Donald Trump got all the votes from that state, from those states. And so that, of course, greatly distorts the translation of popular votes into electoral votes. So that's, that's the essence of the way it works and the, the essence of the problem. And so your book makes the argument that this current system leads to a lot of issues. So under the current system, where do candidates campaign? Where do they go around and ask for people's to votes? Do they go everywhere? 
Well, that's a very good question. And there's a, <clears throat> a long-standing argument made on behalf of, uh, of the Electoral College that the Electoral College forces candidates to draw support from across the nation and that they have to seek their support from across the nation. And somehow they're going to re the winning candidate will receive support from across the nation. So there's a lot of questions there. So let's try to unpack this a little bit. And the fact is, and, and, and I should add, it's particularly the case that advocates of the Electoral College say, well, <clears throat> excuse me, it protects the small states. The small states get attention, and otherwise they just be lost and, and, and all these, uh, this, this big nation. Well, we know exactly where candidates go. We know every place they go. We know every campaign rally they ha they hold, and we know everything they say when they get there. So, because we don't have stealth campaigns for president, there wouldn't be much point to it. So, we actually have very good data, and myself and others have traced exactly where the candidates go. And what happens is, of course, that the candidates go to competitive states, which is a small percentage of the states. So, in 2016. The candidates visited 13 of the 37 smallest states, only 13, about a third. They ignored the rest completely. And actually, 2016 had a lot of battlegrounds, more than normal. Normally, you'd expect it to be a smaller number than 13. But it's not only the small states that they ignore, and I might add, this, this belies the fact that they just they, they do not pay attention to small states. They just get ignored. And you can't do worse than zero. They get zero attention. In 2016, no presidential candidate visited any of the small states. None. There's seven of the very smallest states, and no candidate went to any of them during the entire electoral period. They also don't visit large states like California and New York. Nobody visited California and New York. Why? Because they weren't competitive. Now, there's a lot of votes there and a lot of voters there, but it doesn't matter. They, did, they didn't visit them. So 90% of the visits by presidential candidates in 2016 took place in 14 battleground states. 99% of the ads run in 2016 occurred in those same states. 71% of the ads in the whole election took place or were run in four states. Four states. So we have an election which ignores most, most of the country. That seems pretty inequitable to me. Well, it certainly it certainly violates fundamental fu fundamental principles of political equality, which is really at the core of democracy. You cannot define democracy without involving political equality. No political philosopher of any note of any ideology that I know of has ever tried to do that. It just it just violates the fundamental principles of democracy. So you need to have some pretty good reasons to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can talk about various reasons that are offered uh, on behalf of the Electoral College. One we've just discussed was that it forces candidates to be attended to small states. Well, of course, it doesn't. So that, that can't be. I might add that related to all this and where they campaign and from where they draw their support is the idea where they get it from from all kinds of different geographic areas. Well, all one has to do is look at the election map on election night, and we can project this again in 2020. It's not hard. So we know that Donald Trump is going to win a nice band in the South. Donald Trump is not going to win. Joe Biden is going to win the densely populated states in the Northeast. He's going to win the West Coast states. Uh, so we, we know we know the candidates don't get support from each of the regions. Moreover, there was this idea that, well, the candidates, the Electoral College will force candidates to go across the nation, which of course it doesn't, and they will have to draw support from all kinds of segments of the population. You see, that'll be very good for American consensus. Well, all we have to do is look at where the winning candidates get their support, and particularly, where do the candidates get their support when the Electoral College reversed the popular vote. And we can take two examples in 2000 and 2016. So what happened in 2016 to begin with? Well, did, did Donald Trump win 
and, and that's the particular argument is, well, it's going to help minorities across the country, not just racial and ethnic minorities, but minorities of all kinds, or those who aren't the dominant groups in society. Well, let's see what really happened, because we have very good data on this. So we know that Donald Trump, uh, through no fault of, well, I don't even know I want to say that, Donald Trump did not win uh, African Americans, he did not win Hispanic Americans, Latinos, he didn't win women, all right? So right away, we get to see that major segments of American society did not vote. He didn't, <clears throat> he didn't win the minority religions of Muslims and Jews. He didn't win those at age 14, 18, excuse me, to 44. So that big segment of the age population, he didn't win those who, who made less than $50,000 a year. He didn't win college graduates. He didn't win post-college graduates. What he actually won was white Protestant males, the dominant group in American society throughout American history. So rather than protecting, let us say, uh, minority groups, and I use the word minority loosely here, but I think the audience understands what I'm saying. What it actually did was allow the dominant group in American society to, do, to, to, to win the election over the objections, right, of all of these very important segments of American society. That's what really happens in the real world. And, and everything I just said was even worse in, uh, in the 2000 election. It was even more imbalanced. So that's what really happens in the real world. And one thing I want to underscore here is that when we're talking about uh, candidates only campaigning in a small number of states and ignoring the vast majority of the country, we're talking specifically about in the general election. Um, so in the primary, yeah. candidates have a reason to go all over the country and go to California for Super Tuesday. But in the general election is the, the time frame that we're talking about for this data. And I, I should add that primary, the primary system is completely independent of the Electoral College. You could have, if you had direct election of the president, you still have primaries and they still go to the state. So they're, they're two separate matters. Yeah, absolutely. So that's campaigning. Um, what do you think happens within a society when the leader of our country has a mandate from the Electoral College as opposed to a mandate from the people and the majority of voters? That's, that, that's a good question. And advocates of Electoral College for a long time have claimed that the Electoral College actually gives the winner a mandate. And it's really a pretty simple-minded argument, to tell you the truth, because the argument is, well, even if you only get, let us say, 49% of the vote, you may win 60% of the electoral votes, let us say. So that looks a lot bigger. And it's almost as if they think somehow that's going to fool people. Now, I have a sheet of paper here. I'm going to read some particular statistics, so that's why this paper is in front of me. But we know, we know what happened in 2016. We know that Donald Trump won 45.8% of the vote and lost to Hillary Clinton by 3 million votes in the, in the popular vote. We also know that he, he had a lower, percent, a lower percentage of voters saying they were voting for a candidate uh, than any time since 1980, and that's the period for which we have data in the last uh, 40 years now. In other words, they weren't enthusiastic about the candidate. Donald Trump, the winner, had the lowest feeling thermometer rating of any candidate in the history of the American National Election Studies, which now are over 70 years old. Hillary Clinton had the second lowest, by the way, so it isn't, this isn't a partisan statement. The point is, there was no great enthusiasm for Donald Trump. Immediately after the, the election, 43% of the public had a positive response, 52% had a negative. They were upset or dissatisfied. 29% of the people, 29% of the people after the election said Trump had a mandate. That's what happens in the real world. The first Gallup polls found that he had a lower approval rating than any previous president ever in the history of the Gallup poll, and his approval rating uh, was the most polarized. So what we have here is unless, unless you were just completely out of it, unless you pay no attention to the news, you know, everyone knows, everyone in Congress knows that the president had no mandate. There was no sense that the American people had overwhelmingly voted for a candidate and for the candidate's uh, proposals. After all, the man lost the election. He, 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 he won the job, but he lost the, the, the popular vote in the election. So it doesn't give you a mandate. That's just, that's just a, frankly, it's a silly thing to say. So 
under a national popular vote, do you think that we're going to see candidates just going back and forth between California and New York as the two largest states, maybe Texas as well? Or are they going to campaign all over the country? That, that, that's a very good question. And the, an the, the, the answer is, is important. Uh, <clears throat> now, first of all, we have to remember what we discussed already is that right now candidates ignore most of the country. You can't do worse than nothing, right? That's just impossible. So most of the country gets nothing. They get no candidate visits, they get no ads, they get nothing. All right? I am sure that if there was a national popular vote, candidates would, would <clears throat> disperse their efforts much, much more broadly across the country. Because there's voters everywhere. And if you think that somehow they wouldn't go to the rural areas, which they don't go to now, it actually would encourage them to do what they don't do now, which is go to rural areas. Because there's more swing voters in smaller markets. Moreover, as every every politico knows, but for some reason advocates of electoral college haven't figured this out, it costs less to campaign in smaller markets. You certainly take your ads and put them in those markets because it costs less. There's the same amount of time in a day, but as there's less demand for minutes on a radio station in a smaller market because there's, there's fewer people to to want that radio advertisement, let us say, or television advertisement, than in a larger market. Every Politico knows that. And if you just think, like, I happen to live in Texas. Texas is a big state. We have several of the biggest cities in the country. We also have vast areas that are rural that, that, and have very small population. So does the governor, the candidates for governor of Texas, ignore the rural areas and just, and just campaign in Dallas-Fort Worth Houston, San Antonio, and Austin, maybe El Paso. Is that what they do? Well, we know that's not what they do. We know. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We have absolute perfect data on this, and we know that that's not what they do. <clears throat> so, of course, they're, they're going to spend time in Los Angeles, which they don't spend any time in now at all. Seems to me they ought to be spending some time in California. I mean, it's got nearly 40 million people. It's got 11% of the population. Right now, it gets no attention. They ought to be going to California. They ought to show up in New York, too, for that matter, and New Jersey, and Massachusetts, and areas like that. Of course, they're going to go to Florida. They're going to go to the same state they, because there's population centers in the big battleground states, but they're also going to be competing in rural states because every vote counts. Right now, the Democrats in Texas, the Republicans in California, their votes, it's, it, it doesn't matter if they show up or not because we know how, who's going to win the state. But if indeed you get, you're going to count each vote equally, then it does matter if you show up. And so, and so the candidates know that, and they want to encourage a turnout. They want to, they want to take their message to the people. They want their votes. So it'll be much better. And when you do that, when you have all that, what do you have? You have better party competition. You, you give each party an incentive to build the party structure across the nation. And actually, as much as we might not like parties and politics and all those things, some people just don't like it. Parties are essential to demo making democracy work. Mass parties are an American invention. That's one of our gifts to the political world. <clears throat> it would, you, you would also have, you would have much more incentive on voter turnout. We have terrible turnout. You would, you would have you would increase voter knowledge because one of the things that we know, oddly enough, is that ads inform people. They at least inform people as to the candidate's stances. Uh, and that's important. So that's a good thing. And it would reduce the power of sectionalism. So we have a national campaign, and that's a good thing, too, particularly at times when we're very, very interested in national unity. And I think we all know this very day why that is very important. So going along with the idea of, of political parties, one thing we hear from opponents is that a national popular vote would destroy the two-party system, and we'll see 20 right. people on the November ballot, and a candidate will win with 12% of the vote. What do you say to that kind of outlandish scenario? Well, that, 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 that's, that's a wonderful example of uh, something that's been said for decades, and it makes no sense at all. And all we have to do is think about this right now. Actually, direct election would discourage third parties. Why? 
because <clears throat> under the Electoral College, which actually encourages third parties, you can get prizes. The prizes are states, right? Particularly if you have concentrated uh, support as, let's say, Strom Thurmond in 1948 or George Wallace in 1968, you can win states. You can win prizes. You can get something if you're a third party. And they wanted to use winning those states to deadlock the, the Electoral College and then, and then have leverage in determining who would be elected president. Now, if you think it's a good idea for racist candidates to determine who's going to be the next president of the United States, then you've got to love the Electoral College. But I don't happen to share that view. And, and direct election, there's no potential for uh, deadlock because whoever gets the most votes wins. It's a pretty simple concept. And we have used it to elect millions of candidates in America for a very long time. So I think we understand this system pretty well. And so actually, the Electoral College encourages third parties. But if you have a direct election, you have to come in first or you get nothing. Coming in third gets you nothing. Coming in second gets you nothing. So there's no incentive. And that's one of the things that we understand best about politics. And we've understood that for a very long time. And when we did studies at comparing proportional representation systems and what we call in, in the United States the first past the post system. And in proportional representation systems, and we can think of Israel and the Knesset. In Israel, there's one big electoral system for the whole nation. So that's why they have so many political parties. They have many, many political parties. No party has ever won a majority in in the in the Knesset ever in the history of Israel. But in the United States, we don't have a lot of third parties, and it's because we have first past the post. So it's exactly the opposite of what the advocates of the Electoral College say. There's one other thing that I think is important here. Under the Electoral College, third parties can create a lot of mischief, in addition to what I was just mentioning. In, 19, in 2000, Ralph Nader was on the ballot in a lot of states and drew some votes. Now, we know from polling that in Florida, or in New Hampshire, these are two states we're going to talk about, <clears throat> the the people who voted for Ralph Nader overwhelmingly preferred Al Gore as their, as their second choice. Al Gore, in this case, to George W. Bush. Nader took votes from Gore. If Nader hadn't been on the ballot, Gore would have won Florida. Doesn't matter how, what, anything about Shads, it, would, it wouldn't have mattered, it wouldn't have mattered uh, anything uh, uh, what happened. I think I, I, I lost you for a second. I yeah. don't know. But at any rate, at any rate, so that's mischief from third parties under the Electoral College. That could not happen under direct election. But under the Electoral College, two states, if Gore had won either states, he would have won either of New Hampshire or Florida. He would have won the presidency. He was the preferred candidate to George W. Bush. So that's just mischief of, of, having, of having third parties on the, uh, 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 on the ballot in, in the Electoral College system. So let's talk about that deadlock that you mentioned, because contingent elections under the Electoral College, I think, is a lesser known feature. And a lot of people are honestly mildly horrified when I explain it to them. So for our listeners, a contingent election is when neither candidate wins a simple majority of electoral votes. So say we're tied 269 to 269 or a third party candidate takes some and no one reaches a simple majority. So, Professor Edwards, as a practical example, can you explain what happens if we have a tie or a lack of a simple majority in the Electoral College, um, potentially using sure. what would happen in November if this were to occur, if you think that would be helpful? Right, right. Well, if no candidate receives a majority of electoral vote, the House of Representatives choose the president from the top three candidates, and the Senate chooses the vice president from the top two. But the hor horrifying thing here. And, and we'll just talk about the presidential election for the moment. Each state has one vote. So Wyoming and California, let's make a comparison for the most popular state, which has 39 something million votes and Wyoming, which has fewer than 600,000 votes. So roughly speaking, California has 70 times as many people as, as Wyoming. They each get the same vote. It's the most egregious violation of democratic principles anywhere in American politics. I've never heard of anyone defend this. By the way, uh, Washington, D.C. has no votes. They're completely disenfranchised in, in the selection of the president here. 
the seven smallest states with a population of 5.6 million people can outvote the six largest states with a population of 133.1 million people. Now think about that, 5.6 versus 133.1 million people. So it's a very it's a very bad system. Now there's all kinds of other other uh, arcane aspects of this of, of, of how do you determine which how a state is going to vote, and the state has to have a majority, or they don't their vote doesn't count at all. A majority within the House of Representatives I'm talking about. Um, the Senate could choose a candidate from another party in theory, you know, so that would be delightful. Uh, you can imagine what does it have to do with executive independence from the from the legislature? There's just a lot of problems, a lot, a lot of problems with with, with this system. And as I said, I know of no one who will defend it. I've never seen anyone defend it. Books written about the electoral college, they do not defend it because it's indefensible. But that's what we have, nevertheless. So when we think about how the electoral college functions today. Is it working the way that the founders intended or envisioned? No, it's not working at all how they envisioned. Uh, there were a lot of different reasons to have the Electoral College. I mean, there was concern about the legislature choosing the president and they didn't want intrigue that they, that they saw that there might be or they expected. They, they didn't want the executive to be dependent on the legislature. They did some, some were concerned about democracy. Some were concerned about voter, voter parochialism that they wouldn't know about great great men, it would only be men back then, unfortunately, but only men, you know, somewhere somewhere in the country. Some didn't want the president to be elected by the people because he might be too powerful. He'd have legitimacy. Uh, there was some some concern about slave interests. Um, but at any rate, at any rate, so there's all these reasons they have left and they couldn't figure out what to do. And there had never been such an executive before in the history of the world. So they didn't know what to do. They cabled this thing together, uh, at, uh, cobbled this thing together. At, at the last minute, they finally decided they voted every possible way that you can imagine within, within the Constitutional Convention. And um, all of the goals that they had for the Electoral College are now irrelevant. That's, that's the first thing I want to say. Second thing is they anticipated that the electors would exercise independence, that they make independent judgments. They were not put there as agents of the states. They didn't say, all right, you were an elector for this state. You have to do what the governor says. That's not what they expected. They expected they would be exceptional people, whatever that meant, and that they would exercise independent judgment. Well, clearly, it doesn't work that way at all. It didn't work that way very long, uh, and, and parties were developed and they became agents of parties, not agents of the state, but agents of, of states, but agents of the party. So it doesn't work at all now as the founding fathers intended. And really, I think the most important thing about this is that when people say uh, when someone is elected who didn't get the most votes, well, you know, the founding fathers really knew what they were talking about. You know, they really had this plan. That's not at all the plan they had. They had no such plan of any kind. It's just, it's just uh, complete nonsense to say something like that. Yeah, and I'll just um, add on that uh, the winner-take-all laws that most states use now, the majority of states didn't use that until the 10th election for president. So it's not as if the way that most people understand the Electoral College now is how it was at the founding of the country. Right. We didn't, we didn't do that until parties developed, and then they figured out the majority, the dominant party in the state figured, hey, we can get them all. We can get all the electoral votes. James Madison complained about this to the end of his life. That this is a terror. This is this is not at all a good system. Of course, Madison really his first preference was for direct election. So um, I'm now going to switch over to questions that we've received from the audience. Um, I have already received over 50 questions. So I say that just so everyone knows if I don't answer your question, that is why. <laughs> um, so uh, let me just take a moment. Uh, well, first I'll have a comment that someone read your book many years ago and says it's extremely excellent. So we have some fans Thank in the you. audience. Um, so what about the states 
uh, that insist that they've been delegated the responsibility of conducting their own elections in the Constitution. Um, this seems like an argument against a nationalized election. Do you have thoughts on that? Well, states do administer elections and would, would administer elections under any system that, that we're talking about. So, so it really doesn't get in the way, if you will, of that principle of states administering elections does not get in the way of direct election of the president. I mean, they would have ballots, they could count the ballots, and they would report them to a national, you know, a, a central party. They do that now. They do that. They, they do send the totals in, but what really counts is the electoral, the uh, the electoral vote totals that they send in, which is really what counts. The votes don't actually count. So now the votes would count. So instead of sending electoral votes in, they send vote totals in. So it, it, it wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't change. And I, I might add, it, it doesn't undermine the federal principle at all. Electoral college is not a federal principle. Nobody in the Constitution Convention or in the ratifying conventions ever, as far as I can tell, ever, not once, talked about the electoral college as an, as an element of federalism. It doesn't do anything to enhance the power or sovereignty of states. Federalism is based on representation in Congress and, of course, powers allocated to the state by the, by the Constitution, one of which is to administer elections. Thank you. We've gotten um, a couple of questions about faithless electors. So can you briefly explain what that is uh, and maybe, you know, the current Supreme Court uh, judgment that we're waiting for uh, and, yeah. you know, if it will have an impact uh, on uh, right. states moving forward? Yeah. Right. Well, faithless electors are electors who don't vote for the candidate of their party. Uh, <clears throat> Of course, only the only electors that get to vote, at least in 48 of the 50 states, are, uh, are those representing the party that got the most votes in the state. And occasionally, and a half, a several, that we had several in uh, 2016, that uh, electors choose not to vote for the candidate on the ballot. Uh, they vote for someone else uh, for whatever reasons that they they may have, and. Throughout history, we've had few. Generally, we have one, one, none, one. It happened. There was a bunch in 2016. So it is possible for this to happen. Of course, it's hard to excuse this, uh, and it, it's hard to in any way rationalize this consistent with democracy that these people, who are acting, by the way, as the founding fathers expected the uh, electors would act, they're exercising independent judgment. Uh, but nevertheless, hardly anyone would, will defend this. Well, some states have passed laws saying you can't do that. And some states remove electors when they announce they're going to do it and they, they put in another elector on, on the spot. But some states have, have tried to uh, uh, have punishments and, and anyhow restrict the discretion of electors. So the case has gone to the Supreme Court. We do not have a decision on this. And, and the question, the question is, can states do that? Now, I think we know that states, that the founding fathers expected the electors to exercise discretion. But of course, faithless electors are nobody's friend. Uh, you know, it's not a Democrat or Republican issue. Nobody really thinks that's a good idea. And so the question is, if you expected them to exercise discretion, can you constrain them? In, so, in some fashion. Now, that, there are fancy arguments to, to be made here, and they, they were made in this case, but we will have, presumably, a, a definitive answer to this uh, soon, and then, and, and then we'll know. Uh, so we just, we, just, we just have to wait. But that's the issue of faithless electors. Um, here's a, a good question to help clarify something for some minute. So what makes a state a swing state? A state's a swing state if it's if it's in play, meaning that either candidate has a chance to win. So there's some states, let us say Mississippi. Mississippi is definitely going to vote for Donald Trump, right? I mean, I, I, I predict that with great confidence that Mississippi is going to vote for Donald Trump. California is going to vote for Joe Biden. I'm pretty sure, right? I think I got that one, all right? 
However, we don't know how Florida's going to vote. We don't know how Michigan's going to vote. We don't know how Pennsylvania's going to vote. We don't know how Wisconsin is going to vote. We don't know how North Carolina is going to vote. So those votes are highly competitive. And as a result, the candidates pay a lot of attention. If you looked at where Donald Trump and, and Mike Pence have been traveling when they had discretion and just, just in, the, in the last month or two, uh, you'll see they, amazingly, I don't know how it happens, but coincidentally, they show up in swing states. Pretty amazing, you know. Uh, but that's, and that's where they're going to run their ads. That's where they're going to run their ads. That's where they're going to visit. Because those are the states that play. There's no point and, and, and going to Wyoming, because you know how Wyoming is going to vote. It's going to vote Republican. So, you know, why would you waste money on ads? Why would you waste valuable time going out there campaigning when you could campaign in a state that could make you know, that, that's up for grabs and it could make a big difference in your election? So, um, would you, it seems that the electoral system violates the principle of one person, one vote expressed in the Constitution. Would this be accurate? And would you describe the current system as undemocratic? Yes, it, it definitely uh, violates the, the principle of, of political equality, because not all votes count the same. Just, just in the beginning of the, just the mere allocation of electoral votes uh, is not, is, is not uh, it violates equality, because some states particularly small states, do a little bit better than the big states. That's not the biggest problem. That's not the biggest problem. But yes, I, this is definitely, and anytime you violate political equality, you're violating fundamental principles of democracy. As I said, every philosopher that I know of, and we can think of Robert Dahl, probably the most important political philosopher uh, of the 20th century and, philosopher, and, and thinker about democracy, just read him and always, you know, the notion of political equality is absolutely central concepts of democracy. So um, I've gotten a couple questions about partisanship. So specifically for abolishing the Electoral College, is there a partisanship favor? Um, do you know of any mainstream national level Republicans that are calling for abolishment? I know we have Elizabeth Warren on the Democratic side and several of her Democratic colleagues. Well, over time, there's certainly been, there's certainly been uh, prominent Republicans who have advocated abolishing the Electoral College. Robert Dole was, is, is one. Uh, uh, but it is, and there was, a, there was a time, not that long ago, when it was common to say, well, the Democrats have a lock on the Electoral College. That was kind of silly to say, because clearly they, they, they did not uh, have a lock on the Electoral College. But now, in highly polarized times, and since uh, and since uh, Donald Trump's victory in particular, that opinion about the Electoral College has become highly polarized as well. So Republicans have now turned against uh, abolishing the Electoral College. Um, and I think, frankly, it's not a matter of some philosophical principle, I think it's a matter of, well, we win under the Electoral College. And I think it's, it's as simple as that. So it has become a partisan issue where traditionally it was not a partisan issue. But because the Republicans have won two elections in this century, two of the five elections in this century, as a result of the Electoral College, and, and in other words, losing the popular vote and winning, that it's become a partisan issue for them. That's very unfortunate. Because things may change, mm -hmm. uh, just like those who thought the Democrats had a lock. There may be, you know, Republicans may not have a lock on this uh, forever. And uh, uh, so things may change, and they may come to regret that. For myself, I don't care which party uh, benefits in the short term or whatever. I think that we, ought to, we ought to make these decisions on matters of, of, of principle. So what is your best argument to those white Protestant males, to use your example from earlier, about why the Electoral College is bad and why we should change it? Well, the, the argument is really the, what, what I've been saying. It violates principles of democracy. So if you believe in mock democracy and you believe in principal behavior, then you should want to change the Electoral College. If you think that everybody's vote should count equally, then you should want to get rid of of the Electoral College. And, and, and if you think that you, whatever your group is, I happen to be 
one of those white males, right? Uh, but uh, if you think that for some reason that you should you, you, that that you should have a leg up, that you should have an advantage in determining uh, outcomes in the nation, uh, then I guess you'd like the electoral college. But I don't. I don't think any group should have that. And I don't. Uh, and most white Protestant males, many a great many white Protestant males, agree with me uh, that that they should not ha have a special advantage. That everyone. Uh, should should be equal, and that that is a rather fundamental principle in American politics, and it has been for a very long time. So, um, what about proportional allocation of electors? Do you think that that is a fix that would be good for the country? Well, it it is it it's not really it won't it, it doesn't do the job that we want it to do because there's always going to be a distortion. I mean, we 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 run uh, many, many simulations on this, and, and, and we can look at, at what would happen uh, under various scenarios, and we can just look right now. I mean, if, 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 if you took uh, what happened in 2016 and just say, okay, who won what congressional districts, and then we'll divide and <laughs> do whatever with, with the Senate, uh, the two electors for the Senate, you, you, would, have, you would have had the same problem. Once you get, because, because people are not spread evenly across the country, uh, <clears throat> it turns out that Democrats tend to be more concentrated. As a result, they have, they have a, uh, a, a disadvantage. It's not anybody's fault that they're concentrated. They, they, they tend more to live in urban centers, for example, so they're concentrated and they waste their votes in effect. Because once you get one vote over 50%, every other vote is wasted. So, <clears throat> There, there are more natural Republican districts than Democratic districts at, at the moment. And then when you put in, add to that gerrymandering, which means that, that the districts don't necessarily represent public opinion or the voters, <clears throat> and I think we all know about gerrymandering, the way we draw district boundaries to distort the results, it means <clears throat> that one party might have an advantage. And this, it, right now, just right now in American politics, the Republicans could be the Democrats. If the Democrats were had, had control in more states, then the Democrats might be doing the same thing. I'm against gerrymandering as well, by the way, just for a matter of principle. But as, as a result, that's not, that, it only would encourage more gerrymandering because the gerrymandering would have an outcome not only for the, the results of uh, the legislative elections, but also can affect presidential elections. So it doesn't actually do the job, although I, I understand the, 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 the goals of those advocating it. Um, and I just want to underscore, because I have some questions about this uh, idea of gerrymandering. Um, gerrymandering doesn't too much affect the current system because only two states use congressional district allocation. But if there was a movement for many more states to do that, then you would incentivize congressional gerrymandering even further uh, because it right. could help impact the presidential election. Um, so I think that I want to give you kind of an opportunity to give a, a closing minute before I explain National Popular Vote Compact a little bit. I mean, this has happened. Five of our 45 presidents came into office without having the most votes. We see candidates going only to certain parts of the country, uh, and it, it violates the principle of one person, one vote, right? Like, what would be your, your short spiel to really give people an answer of why should we abolish this system? Uh, you know, it's in the Constitution. Shouldn't we just keep it? Yeah. Well, we definitely shouldn't keep it. We have spent a lot of time democratizing the Constitution. If you look at the amendments after the Bill of Rights, you see how we've expanded franchise. We changed the system that we inherited. We changed it. Not only who could vote, but for whom we could vote. So now we vote for senators. We couldn't vote for senators until the 20th century. But we have continuously democratized. We ought to continue that. Because this violates, uh, well, let me step back. I said you have to have a good reason to violate political equality. You have to have a good reason. When we examine the reasons offered by advocates of electoral college, they all fail. There is no good reason. Every one of them fails. In fact, the arguments are typically 
exactly the opposite of what the advocates say. When we and then analyze them, it's exactly the opposite. Like preserving the party system, it's exactly the opposite. This is time and time again we find that to be true. Moreover, not only do we, don't, don't we get benefits from the electoral college, but we have costs. We have costs, as you said, and not having a national campaign, not having a, a party competition, not having voter information. <clears throat> That is not the way to run an election in a great nation. So what we ought to do is count all the votes equally. It's a very simple idea. Count all the votes equally make every, and have candidates advocate every, for every single vote in America. That's what we ought to have. So that's why I think we should have direct election as president. Excellent. Thank you. So all of those points that you just made and uh, much of our discussion today focuses around exactly that, the case for direct election of the president. Um, and, you know, people listening in, you'll notice uh, not all of our questions revolve around the specific case for abolishing the Electoral College, despite that uh, being a part of the inherent book title. So there's a specific reason for this. Now, there are two ways to achieve a national popular vote. The first is passing a constitutional amendment to replace the Electoral College with a direct vote for president. This can be achieved one of two ways, an amendment being passed by two thirds of the US House and the US Senate, and then ratified by three fifths of the states. There's a second way to achieve a constitutional amendment, which is for two thirds of the states to call for a constitutional convention. However, the US has never used this method for passing an amendment since ratifying the constitution. So the second way to achieve a national popular vote is through our legislation, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact or the National Popular Vote Bill. Um, this is a piece of legislation that is uh, authored and supported by my organization, National Popular Vote. And it's considered a reform to the Electoral College that accomplishes those same goals of a direct election of the president, a national campaign, making every vote equal, uh, and making sure that wherever your ballot is cast, it doesn't matter, it has an equal opportunity to impact the outcome of the election. So under our bill, the presidency is guaranteed to whoever gets the most votes in all 50 states and DC. And if we recall back to Professor Edwards' explanation at the beginning, 48 states use these statewide winner-take-all laws to award their electors. The National Popular Vote Bill changes that law. The US Constitution says each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. Our bill uses that power that was given to the state legislatures by the framers of the Constitution to change the way that they vote within the Electoral College. This bill only goes into effect in states when enough have signed on that we have at least 270 electoral votes, which is the current number that's a majority of the Electoral College, the number that you need to win the presidency. So as soon as that 270 threshold is reached, our bill kicks in and all of those states that have passed this bill now have laws that award their electors to the candidate who gets the most popular votes in all 50 states in DC. My organization lobbies for this bill state by state, and so far it's been passed by 16 jurisdictions with a total of 196 electoral votes, which means we're over 70% of the way towards enactment of this bill. So we at National Popular Vote are building the movement to elect the president by national popular vote through this method. This is a nonpartisan movement which has bipartisan support. We, we touched on some of the partisanship earlier. Um, and, you know, I uh, lobbied for this bill myself here in Oregon last year. And this bill would not have passed without uh, Oregon Republican senators voting for it. We had several Democratic senators that voted against it, but the Republicans were the margin that got us over the line. So this still remains a bipartisan bill, or excuse me, a nonpartisan bill with bipartisan support. So, if you wanna make sure that 2020 is the last election we have under the current system, I hope that you'll make, help us make that a reality. Um, you can advocate for this bill in your state, or if you're in a state where it's already law, you can join nationwide efforts to support those calling for action in their own states.
You can visit our website, uh, nationalpopularvote.com slash volunteer to sign up to get involved. We're doing monthly webinars like this with authors, political scientists, professors, and legislators, and more to focus on the many reasons that the country would be better off with direct election of the president. We also conduct webinars explaining some of the more nitty gritty details about how our bill works and working to address the many questions that come up about a direct election for president and how you as an individual advocate can learn to answer them and go out and issue your community and become an advocate for this movement. So visit our website uh, to navigate and navigate, uh, visit our website, which is nationalpopularvote.com and navigate to the events page to find out more about our virtual events. So I really encourage you to get involved because for our movement, the National Popular Vote Organization we can't reach 270 electoral votes without state legislators hearing from their constituents and we need all of you to make this happen so i hope that you'll sign up to get involved uh, because the direct election of the president is a critical reform to uh, improving our democracy and uh, it's just something that we really all should be able to get behind so professor edwards i want to thank you so much for your time uh, having the foresight to write this book back in 2004, certainly long before I was aware of this movement. Uh, I really, I really appreciate your time uh, and your advocacy and, and thank you very much.